Okay, so I guess we should start. Oops. So can I have my side? Okay, so I get to be the warm-up act for Joanne tonight, which is really fun. So, okay. I promised Joanne this would be terrible. And it will be. So, okay, so it turns out that I've actually, and I've never told her this, I've felt a kindred connection to Joanne ever since we started this cooking class. When did we start this? Two years ago. And there's a reason for it that all of you may not be aware of. So it turns out that Joanne was a graduate of Harvard College, true. And her major was applied mathematics, true. So it turns out I run the applied math major at Harvard. And when I started, you know, the first year when Dave and I and all of the people, we were all putting together this cooking class, I often thought to myself, how did a poor, nice mathematician end up doing this? <laughs> And then I would think of Joanne. <laughs> and, and of course, she's escaped from mathematics, which is good. And, um, and so, because if she hadn't, you all wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I decided today to sort of show Joanne and all of you what happens to a mathematician when they think about baking. Um, and, and, and it's really going to be bad. And I want to show this to you. And it's called bakery phase diagrams. So phase diagrams, because Joanne, you may not know this, but we've talked a lot in this lecture series about phase diagrams. We've talked about phase diagrams of everything. But today I'm going to show you recipe phase diagrams. OK, are you ready? So um, the first thing I'm supposed to do before getting into that is to thank our sponsors. So as you all know, this lecture series um, has a rich list of sponsors. So Jose Andres' food, Think Food Group, the Alicia Foundation, Whole Foods at River Street is continuing to donate food for our undergraduate labs, and you all should please shop there. Um, Zertoli Olive Oil, Taza Chocolate, Specialty Foods Boston, and Oya. Um, so it is also true, I was also told to tell all of you that um, this is an aside, but it's an important one if you're interested in this. So Farron Adria's coming, I believe, on December 3rd. The tickets for him, so they're free tickets, but they're available at Harvard's box office on November 29th. I hope I got the number right. Yeah, I did it right. Okay, so if you want to go, you have to get tickets. So um, that's the only ticket of the event. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story that was done with a bunch of undergraduates and a graduate student at Harvard. And I'm going to do it very quickly. It's called Bakery Phase Diagrams. So, there, um, um, so there's this long list of people, and I put three of their pictures up here. Elaine Angelino, Diana Kai. Elaine is a computer science graduate student. Diana is a computer science undergraduate. Naveen is a graduate student in cooking extraordinaire science and cooking person who must be here someplace. Um, and then there's a whole host of undergraduates. And um, we decided to try to make phase diagrams of recipes. And so here's the deal. So we're going to, so Joanne's going to talk about baking and is going to teach us a lot about it. And so here's a recipe of, for sugar cookies. And if you look at any recipe on allrecipes.com, you will notice that there are two parts. There are the ingredients and there are the directions. So right now we're only going to focus on the ingredients since this problem is already too hard for me. So, okay, so now as you all know, you know, the absolute amount of ingredients doesn't matter. All that really matters is the ratio. So, I mean, you, you might consider, you know, the various, the relative amounts of things is all that matters. And so, for example, if you wanted to think about this simply, so here's like a, a standard bread recipe. You know, you can mix water and flour and get bread. So 40% is water, 60% is, is flour, and that's bread. And so now, since we want to make bre um, bakery phase diagrams, what we're going to do is very unusual, and we're going to express this on a plot. So what you can do is you can make a plot where you can plot flour on the x-axis and water on the y-axis, and you can put a dot at the bread recipe. See, this is what would have happened to you if you hadn't escaped. So, um, so, um, so in, you, know, you can then sort of play around with it and think about recipes that way. And of course, it works for bread, but it also works for more complex recipes too. Like here's my favorite brownie recipe. So you can take all of the ingredients, and they have percentages. There are lots of ingredients. And you know, of course, you can't represent all of them on a plot, because I don't know about you, but I can only make a plot with two and, at most, three axes. And so you, know, you just pick a couple of your favorite ones, and you start making plots. So sugar, cocoa powder, flour, things like this. So here is the brownie recipe on a plot. So this is um, flour, and this is sugar. And that star is the brownie recipe. This is the baker's breast brownies recipe, which is the only one I know how to make. So OK, so um, anyway, so that's one dot. So you say, well, that's very interesting. Well, what about all recipes? Wouldn't it be great if you could do that for everything? So well, this is the 21st century. 
And so, um, and so well, well, you can imagine doing this. And so what we did is the following thing. So Elaine and Diana downloaded, uh, this may not be legal, actually. Um, we downloaded all the recipes from allrecipes.com. So we have an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> which has on it all the recipes. And once you have them, then you can start making plots. And this is a bit of a, tri a tricky matter to do. Um, that, that is, and there's a lot of steps, and I'm going to go through them very quickly because you guys want to hear Joanne. You know, you have to, you have to look at the, the thing, and then you have to look at the HTML source code, then you have to figure out how to find the patterns, and it's just a nightmare. And you write computer programs, it's really a nightmare. <laughs> and you end up with this thing with all of this thing. That's our spreadsheet, you see. And, um, and anyway, but then when you're done, you can say, gee, I know about the baker's best brownie recipe. What do all the brownie recipes look like? And so we did this, and this is the answer. So this is sugar. Um, this is water, and those are all the brownie recipes in allrecipes.com. So isn't that interesting? So now it's not clear what it means. And so then you say, well, um, so then you say, well, gee, you know, what about other recipes? This is so great. So you can take the brownie recipe, and then you take a sugar cookie recipe, and you notice that the sugar cookie has different ingredients than the brownies. You knew that already. But so then you can say, well, let's make plots of sugar cookies. So you take all the sugar cookies. And there's all the sugar cookies on, on, on the thing. And then you say, well, what about pancakes? Um, and so you know, there are pancakes. Those are all the pancake recipes. And then you sort of go crazy, and you have lots of things, points everywhere. <laughs> and then if you're creative, so this is the only way you can create a new food if you're a mathematician, is you then say, well, look, there's a star up there that's not there. So that must be a new food. So see, we discovered a new food. So that's how we discover new foods. So, so OK, but now I want to, and I'm, this is just going to take three more minutes, is that you then say, well, because we're, we're supposed to ask questions. I mean, it's a question of what you do with this. It's not clear what you're supposed to do with this. But, um, but anyway, so here's a question. This is one thing that we did with this. Um, so you could ask yourself, here's a question. What constrains the set of recipes? That's an interesting question. I mean, so how many of you have cooked brownies? So, um, so when you <laughs> so when you cook brownies, then um, there's just a little region of phase space that has brownies, and, and if you go far out, maybe it'll be something else. So you can ask, why is that? So we sort of were sitting around wondering what constrains them, and we came up with two hypotheses that I wanted to show you. There are two hypotheses. So here they are. Two hypotheses. Number one is history, and number two is physics. And let me explain what I mean by that. So history goes with the following thing. Well. There have been a few creative chefs in all of eternity, and they invent new dishes, and everyone else just tinkers with them and makes new dishes. And the reason that the brownie recipes look like they do is because that's just the way brownies are. That's the recipes are. Number two is physics. So you could say the laws of physics are brutal. The recipes that can be invented have been invented. The recipes that haven't been tried don't work. <laughs> that's the, those are the two possibilities, right? And you know, if you're a poor mathematician, see if you hadn't, then you'd have to, this is the only shot you have of inventing a new food. So anyway, so I just want to tell you about history. We don't have time to do this. So, so I'm going to show you a little bit of history, and then we're going to stop. So let me show you what I mean by this. So suppose you go to allrecipes.com, and you find a recipe. So this is a recipe for Aunt Gail's oatmeal cookies. And then suppose somebody else, you, you go and you find another recipe. Here's another recipe. It's coconut rolled sugar cookies. And then suppose you want to pretend like you're smart because you don't know how to cook, like me. And you say, well, I want to invent a new recipe. So here is something you could do. What you could do is you could average the two recipes. We do that all the time. So you just take the two recipes and you add them together. And then you say, well, I've done it. I've invented a new recipe. We do that all the time. OK, so you do that all the time. So, so the question is, is, is that really a new recipe? So who thinks it's a new recipe? Who thinks it's not a new recipe? Wow, so some, most of you didn't vote. That, this isn't going to work. <laughs> who thinks it's a new recipe? Who thinks it's not a new recipe? OK, so I think the not a new recipe one. I don't really think it's a new recipe. I mean, come on, you just took two things that were known and you averaged them. That's not new. I mean, you wouldn't apply that to any other part of your life, averaging them is new. You take so red it, and yellow and you mix them together and you make a new color. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. OK, that's a good point. But let's ignore that for the moment. So, so what we wanted to ask ourselves was, to what extent are the brownie recipes in allrecipes.com, to what extent do they reflect creativity? And to what extent do they reflect new? And we actually, so Elaine and I did a little test. We wanted to see if allrecipes.com would take any brownie recipe. So we put up a recipe which contained broccoli as an ingredient. <laughs> and they wouldn't take it. They, they rejected it. So apparently, they do have some standards. Um, <laughs> So, um, so the question is, to what extent are these, are these averages of things? So, we, so, we, so we wanted to find this out. So the following is what we did. 
Um, we, we went, we started calling up people, and we said, can you tell us what the most important recipes for brownies and cookies that were ever invented were? Just tell us. And so we were sent to lots of old books. And we went to the old books, we got the recipes, and we plotted them on the phase diagram. So these are the canons. So there are these points. These are canons pre-1900, 1900 to 1950, et cetera. These are, we just called people up and, and asked for the canon. And then, then the question is, is how can we tell if the online recipes are new or are they merely linear combinations of the canon? And it turns out um, that, and this is what's really cool. So Joanne, I would like to tell you a mathematical fact. There's one mathematical fact. Actually, not Joanne. She was an applied math major. She knows this. It's the rest of you. Um, so it turns out that the set of recipes that can be obtained by averaging the others is inside what is called the convex hull. This is, you've learned a mathematical term today, of the points. And what you do, it sounds really sophisticated because we all like to make ourselves sound smart. But what it really means is the following. So what you do is you take all the points, and you take the points on the outside, and you just connect the dots. And everything inside is boring. So therefore, we immediately see that in these recipes, there is a huge, uncreative region. <laughs> Whereas outside, there is some hope at creativity. It's only around the edges. So creativity um, lives only around the edges. Anyway, that's, that's where I wanted to end um, <laughs> um, with that idea. And now, actually, we'll see Joanne, um, um, who will show us actual creativity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> First, I have to say um, how incredibly surreal and daunting it is for me to be on this side of the lectern. I remember taking Computer Science 50 when I was a sophomore over 20 years ago, and that class kicked my butt. And I pulled more all-nighters for that class than any other class. And when people ask me, did Harvard help you at all in your current career, um, what I tell them is that it taught me that I can pretty much do anything if I can pass CS50. So um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, thank Professor Brenner um, for inviting me and thank Harvard for having me. It's an incredible honor to be here. Again, this is very strange for me, um, having sat on that side for so long. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Bethany, um, who is a baker who, for me at Flower, who created this PowerPoint presentation. I didn't really know what PowerPoint was, and I knew I had to have some sort of pictures, and I reached out to Bethany, and she says, I know how to do it. So everything that you see on the screen, she, she created and developed. Um, in 2007, the Food Network approached me and said, we are about to start a new series called The Science of Sweets, and we would love for you to film the pilot episode. Um, I am fascinated by the relationship between science and baking, and so I jumped at the chance, and I said I would love to. Um, the very first day, they came to the bakery, uh, and they whisked me and a bunch of sticky buns away. <laughs> um, and we went into a hotel room, and they had me spend an entire day talking about sticky buns and drawing all sorts of fractals. and. <laughs> I had to look up Fibonacci sequence because I had forgotten it, but I, they made me write it up on a board. Um, there, was, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that they had me do. Um, there was stuff with protractors, which I didn't understand <laughs> what that had to do with chemistry and baking, but I figured they're the ones who know what they're doing, so I'm just going to follow their lead. Um, the, ne the next day, the next day, uh, they had me teaching sticky buns to a group of actually Harvard students. They put a Craigslist ad out and said, we want you to teach sticky buns. And in the middle of my class, I look up and I see Bobby Flay. Um, and I realized that, well, actually, I had no idea what he was doing there. I actually said to him, I'm in the middle of doing this pilot episode, so I'll have to talk to you later. And he said, no, I'm here to challenge you to a throwdown. Um, at that point, at that point, I said, yeah, but really inside, I was very confused. And you'll see in a second, I, I say, really? There's no science of sweets? I'm really, really upset and kind of shocked. Um, but in the end, see? I'm, 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 like, I'm like, come on, really? <laughs> OK. I'm glad I studied so hard for this class. I'm going to skip past that. OK. So um, when I got invited to come to the class, then I was really thrilled because now I get to actually talk about the stuff that I was hoping we would talk about in that, in that show. Um, and then in the end, I wasn't that disappointed that Throwdown came because we did win, so that was great. 
Okay, so um, there are chefs and there are bakers, and it seems like there are many more chefs than bakers, but people who like to cook often say that they can't bake. They think that it's too precise, um, there's too much chemistry, uh, they don't like to measure things, they don't want things to be too exact. Um, and it's true, if you are making something like a beef stew, you can start off with beef, some onions, throw in some carrots, add some potatoes, put a little salt, a little rosemary. Oh, I went too fast, sorry. Um, and taste it, let it simmer for an hour or so, add a little bit more of this, more of that, and when the vegetables are cooked and the beef is tender, you have beef stew and you feel very proud. Um, in baking, it's not quite that easy. Uh, there is definitely, for most recipes, uh, a sequence that you need to follow. Um, and there's also a certain proportion that you need um, when you're baking. Um, science and chemistry is definitely much more important, I think, in baking than in cooking. Um, so what I wanted to do today is share with you my perspective of chemistry and baking that we see in the field. Um, I know that in the classroom, even just what you just did was so much more than, than we do in, in the kitchen. Um, we don't think about it quite like that, but there's definitely a lot of things that we do think about that I want to um, talk about tonight. Okay, so if I were to do a class or a lecture on the relationship between science and baking, um, it would probably take several weeks because we could talk about cookies, custards, I'm just trying to make y'all hungry, um, <laughs> ice cream, croissant, donuts, blueberry pie, uh, brioche au chocolat, or bread. Um, what's next? Aha. But instead, we're going to talk about cake. Uh, I'm going to focus on cake um, because there's a, a number of different chemical reactions and scientific things that go on in making a cake that I think hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, and the goal in terms of understanding what we're trying to do in making a cake is we want a light, fluffy, delicious birthday cake, which you see right now on the screen. Um, so what I thought I would do is just go through the main ingredients and kind of give you my perspective on what I see and from what I understand is going on. Um, and if you, anybody who does know anything that's different, please raise your hand because this is just kind of what we see in the field um, and it might not actually be the case because I did a little bit of studying for this, but again, this is just kind of what we see. Um, okay, so, okay, so cakes. We have butter. Sugar, eggs, milk or liquid, vanilla for flavoring, and flour. But I'm going to start with leavening. I'm going to start with leveling, leavening because to me this is one of the most important things about baking and especially when you're baking cakes. Um, just to give a little bit of background, a leavening agent, um, or to leaven, is, comes from the old Latin word levar, which means to raise. Um, and basically, a leavening agent is something that you mix into your batter to make it rise and grow. Um, if you don't have a leavening agent, then you're going to end up with something like a mud pie. So it's very important when you're baking a cake. There are four ways that you can leaven a cake or a batter. There's air, there's steam, there's yeast, and there's chemical. We're first going to talk about air. Um, it's the most basic uh, part of leavening. Um, so when you're mixing a cake batter, what you want to try to do is create as much air as possible within the cake batter and capture as much air as possible. Um, because when air is heated, it expands several times over. And so if you imagine your batter that has a lot of air in it, as soon as it goes into the oven, it poofs up a little bit. And that's what you want so that you have a fluffy cake. So one of the ways that we do this in baking is we cream, let me see, if, oops, wrong. Almost. We cream um, butter and sugar together. If you take room temperature butter and then you mix it with sugar, if you imagine sugar crystals, they're, they're actual crystals. And the way I like to imagine is that it's like when you're gardening and you take a garden hoe and you're hoeing up your garden and you take all of that dirt that's been cold and frozen over the winter and you're aerating it. That's exactly what the sugar crystals are doing to the butter when you do what's called creaming the butter. Um, it gets its name because butter usually looks, I don't know how to 
do this back and forth, but if you remember the butter, it was yellow, and when you add sugar to it and you cream it, it ends up looking white, and so it ends up looking pale like cream. So the action of creaming creates lots of little microscopic air bubbles within the butter, and that is the air that's gonna help leaven your cake. A second step, uh, a second way to add air um, into your cake is by adding eggs into your cake. And I'm gonna talk about eggs in just a little bit, but I wanted to talk about air. Um, when you add eggs to a cake batter, the, the egg acts as an emulsifier, which is something that allows you to hold in more air than it would on its own. So again, I'm gonna talk about that in just a sec when I um, talk about eggs, but that's another way we add air when we're, when we're creating a cake batter. Okay, the next way is through steam. Um, we want to take advantage when we're making a cake batter, we want to take advantage of the fact that steam and water, when it goes into the oven and gets heated, that the water turns to steam and that the steam expands to 1,100 times its original volume. So whenever you have something that has liquid, whenever you have a cake batter that has liquid, then as soon as that goes into the oven, it's going to turn into steam and then that steam is gonna do that little poofing thing that you want to make a really light cake. Um, so two common ingredients in cakes, you have butter, which is 80% fat, typically about 2% milk solids, and then 18% water. So that's really, really helpful because you have 18% of that butter that you've put in your cake is gonna turn into steam. And then egg whites, there's a, often a lot of egg whites within um, a cake, and egg whites are actually 90% water. A third way to leaven um, is with yeast. And this isn't a common thing for making cakes, but I wanted to bring it up because it's such an important part of baking. Um, yeasts are basically single-celled organisms that live in the air. There's yeast in the air right now. Um, and when you make a bread, the yeast come into the bread and they feed on the sugars that are in the, the bread dough. Yeast, yeast actually occur also naturally in things like um, grapes. And if you can see the kind of white stuff that's on the, the surrounding the grapes, all of that is where yeast lives. And so you can make what's called a starter with grapes and flour and water and just mix them all together. And then all those yeasts will eat the flour and create what's called a starter for bread. So the way yeast works is, let me see. Oh, and then, um, so what we've been able to do is we've been able to domesticate, so to speak, yeast and create the, the dry yeast, the dry yeast packets. Um, but just so you understand how yeast works, they're these single-celled organisms and they feed on sugar. And so when you make a bread dough and you mix yeast into it, the little yeasts, they eat up all the sugar and then, just like people, they burp and they fart. And all of the carbon dioxide that they're burping and farting is what creates the rise in bread dough. And so the thing about yeast is that they only like to eat at a certain temperature and they only feel comfortable letting out gas at a certain temperature. So you have to keep dough at a certain temperature in order to create the right opportunity to make your bread grow. Um, and it also takes a certain amount of time. So yeast is very important in baking, but it's not used so much in cakes. However, what is used mostly in terms of leavening cakes are chemical leaveners. And there's two main chemical leaveners. There's baking soda and baking powder. And these have actually only been in existence for about the last 200 plus years. Before that, people only used yeast to make things light. Um, but once they discovered baking soda and baking powder, they realized that there was a whole world of pastry that was out there, and it really, really revolutionized the world of pastry. Just in a very general sense, what happens when you use baking soda or baking powder is that these things get mixed, mixed into your cake batter or cookie batter or whatever, and they react either with heat or with liquid or with acid, and then they bubble up and they make little bubbles, and those are those air bubbles that we were just talking about, that when you put them in the oven, the air expands, and then you have a cake that's, that's light and fluffy. So I'm gonna first talk about baking soda. Um, just to give a little history, I thought this was really interesting. I didn't know this before I prepared for this class, but um, basically, uh, before 1790, they had no baking soda, they didn't know to use it. I mean, they had it, but they didn't know what it was for and then they had no baking powder. And so people were making breads and sweet breads using yeast. 
And like I was just saying, the yeast takes time and it's very fickle. It needs a certain room temperature and it needs a certain amount of time. And if you don't treat it well, it dies. And it's just very, very fickle. Um, and one of the things they discovered is that by accident, when you're making a bread dough, if you add what's called potash, which is K2CO3, um, it takes away the sour flavor that often develops when you're making uh, a bread that has to sit and proof over time. And proof is when the yeasts are doing, letting out their gas. So breads get more and more sour as they grow. You want them to grow, but unless you really like sourdough, you don't want them to taste that sour. So you add this thing called potash, which is uh, it's a byproduct of wood ash, and they just found out by accident, by adding it, it took away the sour taste. So they started using potash in bread doughs and in sweet bread doughs, and then they also realized that what used to take two or three days was now only taking a day, or what used to take a day was only taking 20 minutes. So they started to use it more and more, and they thought it was this wonderful ingredient to add to breads. Um, this was back in the 1790s, and then they realized that, uh, or, and then what happened was uh, wood, it's a byproduct of wood ash, and I guess wood ash somehow, for some reason, became less common. Um, and so the French Academy of Scientists had a contest and just said out to everybody, said, hey, can you come up with an alternative to potash because we, we can't find it in the wood ash anymore. There's no more wood ash. So there was a scientist who came up with what's called soda ash, and then from soda ash comes baking soda. And so American bakers in the 1830s took baking soda and realized they could actually make these bread doughs and sweet doughs without the yeast at all. Um, and so that's kind of how American baking kind of took off, because before it had all been mostly the French and the Germans and the Italians. Um, so what happens with baking soda, I think there might be a slide, is um, baking soda reacts with acids. And when it mixes with an acid, it bubbles up. And as you know now, every time you're making a cake batter, you want as many bubbles as you can. And so there's a list of things that we use in baking that are acidic. And so a lot of our cake batters when they, uh, will have buttermilk, lemon juice, cocoa and chocolate, sour cream, brown sugar, and yogurt. And these are the common, common ingredients in a lot of cakes. Um, and so when you have one of these acidic ingredients in a cake batter, then you can also add baking soda, and then you create a little, um, a little bubbles. So we're going to do this really quick. So here's some baking soda. Did it go? So I'm just going to pour some. Oh, that's probably way too much. OK. We're going to pour some baking soda and then a little vinegar. And so you can see. Can you see? Yeah. So that's exactly the reaction that happens in your cake batter when you, well, not exactly that, but <laughs> a version of that. Um, and that is one way, a uh, chemical way, to leaven a cake. The next way is baking powder. So what do you do if you have a cake or cookie or whatever you're making, um, and it doesn't have one of those acidic ingredients? It's not chocolate. You don't want buttermilk. You don't want to put yogurt, whatever. How can you get your cake to leaven? Well, in the early 1800s, um, a guy by the name, a British chemist by the name of Alfred Bird, um, created or discovered how to make baking powder. His wife, Elizabeth, was allergic to yeast, um, and he wanted to try to think of some way that she could have all of these sweets, so he created baking powder. So baking powder, so everyone always asks me, can you substitute baking soda for baking powder? They're entirely different products. Baking, well, sort of, and I can show you. So baking powder, what is baking powder? Baking powder consists of two main ingredients. Baking powder is actually baking soda, and then, plus, wine. No, just kidding, okay. <laughs> um, well, but, so these are wine barrels, and when grapes are, or whatever, the wine is in the barrels, um, and it's fermenting, what gathers on the side is something called must, M-U-S-T, and it's a white, powdery ingredient. And the must is a very acidic powder. So baking powder is simply baking soda 
combined with cream of tartar, which is that stuff on the side of the wine barrels. So baking soda plus cream of tartar gives you baking powder. Um, if you put baking soda into, hold on, let me do this right. If, if you add baking soda to a recipe that doesn't have buttermilk or lemon juice or cocoa or, or brown sugar, one of those acidic ingredients. So if you have baking soda in there, there's nothing for the baking soda to react with, right? What we just did won't happen, and so you'll end up with a leaden cake. So what you can do is you can add baking powder, and then the, the acidic part is part of the baking powder. It's baking soda plus cream of tartar. And there's a couple different um, there's a couple of different kinds of baking powder. There's single acting baking powder and double acting. And what you find in the store is usually double acting baking powder. And in fact, this kind is double acting. Single acting means that when you mix it with liquid, it acts. And the liquid, uh, it makes the cream of tartar and the baking soda, it activates the cream of tartar and the baking soda reaction. You get those bubbles and then that batter gets leavened right then and there and then you wanna get into the oven right away. Um, but what's more common now is double acting baking powder, which is great, and we use it all the time at the bakery because you'll get a little bit of an action with the liquid. So when you add liquid to your cake batter, the liquid will activate the cream of tartar and the baking soda reaction. But then the, the second act for the double acting is when it goes into the oven, and then the heat actually causes the, the baking powder to react. And so you get a little bit of a burst when you first mix your, your cake batter together, and then when you put the whole thing into the oven, that's when you watch it and it rises a lot. Okay, now let's talk about, so that's leaveners. They're typically like the smallest part proportionate, proportionately to the recipe, but um, I spent the most time on them because I think they're very important. Um, but now we're gonna go on to eggs. So, Egg yolks are a great emulsifier, and I was talking about emulsification just a second ago. Um, oil and water, like that, don't mix. And so uh, when you emulsify something, it takes two disparate ingredients, such as oil or fat and water or liquid, and it makes them come together so that they're homogenous. Um, and what egg yolks do is that they allow that to happen. So if you add egg yolk to oil and water, you actually create something that's one, you actually create mayonnaise. And so you can, you know, you can make something that's one thing and not two things like this. Um, so when you add egg yolks to a cake batter, you are creating an emulsification. You are allowing the batter to then mix with the liquid and all of the, the butter or oil or whatever you have that's within your cake batter. And because it's emulsified, it can hold more air. And as we were saying, your whole goal when you're making a cake is to create as many opportunities for air as possible. So the eggs and, and creating the, you know, all of those opportunities for air, um, the egg yolks are really, really rich. They have a lot of fat in them. And so they contribute to texture. They contribute to the crumb, which is basically the, the surface of the, the cake and what it looks like. Um, they contribute to mouthfeel, and they contribute to the smoothness of the batter. So eggs are very important in baking. Okay. Um, egg whites, whether part of the whole egg or used separately, are actually really, really useful in baking as well. Um, so the way I like to view what happens when you're cooking with or baking with egg whites is egg whites, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, are mostly water. Um, they're 90% water, but then they're 10% protein. They consist of protein. Um, that's why they're like a really, they're a really good diet food because it's mostly just water and then you just get a hit of protein. The way I view the proteins are like all those little rubber bands that you have at the bottom of your backpack. You know, they all get kind of like scrunched up a little bit. So we did one. Um, so, and all of the protein strands within egg whites stay like this. When you have a regular egg white, so when you, when you can see through the egg whites, can you see there's egg yolks in there, but there's also egg whites, and plus you can just imagine what egg whites look like. Um, 
you can see through them because all the proteins are like clumped up like these little rubber bands and then there's just the water so you see it all. Um, when you add heat or when you add beating, if you take a whisk and you beat up the egg whites, all of these rubber bands get uncoiled. And then the more you beat them, the more uncoiled they come to the point where they don't, I mean, they're not really round rubber bands, they're actually like strands. So they actually, you know, they're kind of all crumbled up together and then they start to loosen and then they become nice and big and long. And as they become big and long, they start to be able to capture air and they create all of these big air pockets. Now, you have to be a little bit careful because if you, so let, actually, let me just show you that. Okay, so this is what egg whites look like before you beat them. And then once you beat them, this is what they look like. And it's because all of those proteins have been uncoiled and now they're trapping air in them. And so you can't see through them anymore. You can't see the water that's through them because it's all enveloped in this protein bundle that's been created by either whipping or if you put put it into, I mean, if you imagine when you're cooking um, an egg white omelet, it goes from being clear and then it gets white. And that's because all those proteins are uncoiling and then they're causing you not to be able to see through it anymore. Um, when you're whipping up egg whites, if you add sugar, so if you imagine again rubber bands, like the rubber bands, you know, the, you, you pull them, but then they snap back and you pull them and they snap back. Sugar acts as like a stiffener and it makes them when you're pulling them, it makes them kind of stay pulled. And so that's why when you're making a cake with egg whites, you want to add a little bit of sugar, and that'll allow the proteins to kind of stay uncoiled. And again, the whole point is to create as much air as you can. And so if you, if you add the sugar, then the proteins stay uncoiled, and then they'll hold on to the air, and they'll hold on to the water. And that's what's going to give you a, a nice, light, and fluffy cake. Now, if you beat too long, you'll see that what happens is these protein strands, they don't, they, they're not infinitely stretchy, okay? And so if you beat them too long, then they will eventually snap, and then, you can't really see it in this picture, but if you go home and beat a bunch of egg whites for a really long time, you'll see that they start to get kind of foamy looking, and then all the water comes out. And that's because all the proteins have been stretched really, hard, really far, and then they snap. And then they kind of release all the water, and then the water rushes out to the bottom, and then you're just left with like this, this stuff that looks like styrofoam. So the goal when you're making a cake with egg whites is you want to whip the egg whites just enough so that they're kind of stretchy, but you, want, you don't want to whip them too far, because if you whip them too far, then they'll snap and you want to give them enough give so that when you put the batter into the, into the oven, then you imagine that all of the water that's in the egg whites turns to steam, and if you imagine that your rubber band protein strands still have a little bit to give, then they'll grow a little bit with the steam that's in the egg whites, and then you have a nice angel food cake. Okay, now we're going to talk just a little bit about flour. Um, so flour is the structure that holds your cake together, essentially. Um, and the way to think about it is sort of like when you're building a house. It's basically the foundation. And it uh, obviously plays a very important role because it has to hold the weight of the sugar and of the fat, usually butter, that goes into your cake. So there's a bunch of different types of flour. There's every, it starts off with bread flour and then goes to all purpose and then cake flour. Those are kind of the three basic ones. The main difference in the three types of cakes are the protein content. Again, we're going back to protein. And it's kind of the same, I have a different analogy, but it's kind of the same idea. So flour, um, the protein within the, the, the protein content that's in flour is, um, it's like it's it's loose like cotton. It's very loose. It's not very elastic. Um, in fact, it's it has no strength and it's just very airy. And so when you have flour on its own, this is the the protein or the, what's called gluten, um, is is just kind of sitting there, just kind of hanging out. As soon as you add water, 
to flour, it causes the proteins to gain strength. And rather than being loose and fluffy, they start to get kind of stretchy and they actually start to get elastic. And the picture that I was gonna put was of Hanes underwear, but I decided that probably wasn't. <laughs> it was a little too last minute. I had this last minute epiphany last night and I think Bethany had gone to bed and I was like, oh, we should put a picture of Hanes underwear. But, but so if you can imagine, so with flour being the cotton and then when you add water, it becomes the Hanes underwear. Um, <laughs> That's what you're doing when you're adding liquid to flour. So I bring this up because there's so many different role, uh, there's so many different flours and people are always asking, you know, which flour should I use? So if you are making a bread, you actually want something that's really stretchy. I mean, imagine like the best artisan bread loaf that you've ever had. And when you open it up, it's got like all those long, chewy, delicious air pockets. That's all gluten that's been developed because you've added water to your flour and you mix it up and as you mix it it starts to get stretchy and stretchy and elastic and you want that when you're making bread however when you're making a cake imagine the worst cake you've ever had and you take a bite from it and it's like really chewy and maybe kind of tough and that's when you had too much gluten and so when you're making a cake you don't want to use bread flour or high gluten flour you want to use cake flour Cake flour has very little protein in it. So when you add the water to it, you get some of the stretchiness, but you don't get a lot. And you, don't want, a, you want a little bit of stretchiness because you want some of that structure to hold all of the air, whether you're beating up egg whites or whether you're creaming butter and sugar, you need a little bit of structure, but you don't want a lot. And so that's why when you're making a cake, you often use cake flour. All-purpose flour is smack dab in the middle, and it's exactly what it says. It's all-purpose. You can use it for bread. You can use it for cake. Your bread won't be quite as chewy, and your cake won't be quite as tender, but it works for the most part. So, um, okay. And then finally, oh, no, not finally. Another important ingredient is butter. So butter contributes, obviously, to taste, and it also contributes to mouthfeel. Um, but one of the most important ways is that butter, what it does is it coats the flour particles. And so I was just talking about these long, stretchy gluten strands that happen when you mix flour with water. When you add fat or butter to it, the butter coats the flour so that when you add liquid to it, you don't get the stretchy. And so that's what you want because you don't want a lot of stretch when you're making a cake. You want, it to be, uh, you want it to be tender and you want the flour to be protected from the water. And so the butter basically acts as like a little cocoon and it, it protects the, the flour. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna talk about sugar. Sugar um, obviously adds sweetness and flavor, it's essential. Um, but there's a bunch of other things that it does. Uh, sugar attracts water, and so the more sugar you have in a baked good, the more moist your baked good will be. Oftentimes at the bakery, if we have something that's a little dry, um, we either think to add more fat or we'll think to ourselves maybe we should add a little bit more sugar because if you add a little bit more sugar, it attracts water that's in the air, and then your baked good ends up being a little bit more moist. Sugar also um, acts as the creaming ingredient when you're combining butter and sugar, like I talked about. And it's, remember the garden hoe? The sugar is going to be in there kind of digging out all these little air particles. Sugar, just like butter, also cuts through the gluten strands. So um, it's very helpful to have in cakes because you're, what you're always trying to do is combat the development of gluten in a cake because you want your cake to be as tender as possible. Um, this is just a nice loaf of bread. <laughs> I forgot. I don't know why it's there either. I was trying to figure it out last night, but anyway, I thought it looked nice. Um, but sugar also, uh, this is melted sugar that has reached caramelization, which is at like 290, I think, or 300. But um, so sugar within a baked good, when you imagine it, if it's in the oven, um, it, it starts to caramelize and it contributes to the color. But also what contributes to the color is what's called the Maillard effect, which people who like to cook often know about it because they talk about it when you're, um, when you're grilling steaks and it's that 
really nice char on the grill with the steak. But in baking, the Maillard effect actually comes into play with sugar because the sugar that's in breads and cakes and cookies and all of that, it reacts with the amino acids that are in, that are in flour and it creates browning. So you get browning both from the caramelization of the sugars and you get browning from the Maillard effect. So two separate things, but they, they end up looking the same. Okay. We at Flour decided to try a bunch of different cakes a bunch of different ways just to see what they would be like. Um, so we tried a cake without any leavening whatsoever. Um, and I actually have it. I have some here, and I'll cut these up so that some, I don't have enough, I have enough for everybody to have the good cake, but I didn't have enough for everybody to have the bad cake. So, and I don't, I don't know that you really want the bad cake, it's pretty bad. Um, but anyway, so this is uh, a basic yellow birthday cake, the recipe's at the end, so you can jot it down and make it at home. Um, but this has no baking soda and no baking powder. And what we did was we baked all these cakes, and I um, had all the bakers come together and try them all, and, and just, and I didn't tell them which was which. And I said, you know, shout out what, what you think they all are. So this one, gummy, super dense, sticky, and sour. And all of that made sense because there's absolutely no leavening. I mean, there's no chemical leavening. There is the leavening from the creaming of the butter and the sugar. There is the leavening that happens with the water that's in the butter and the water that's in the eggs that does do a little bit of poof. So you don't quite get, you know, a mud pie, but it's not really, I don't know if you can see. Can you see it on there? Yeah. No. It's pretty dense. Um, it's also really sour because this cake is made with buttermilk. <laughs> I don't know where the camera is. This cake is made with buttermilk. And um, there's nothing to react with the buttermilk. So it just tastes really sour. It's actually pretty gross. But a lucky few of you will get to try it. Okay, then we also tried no baking soda. Um, and this one, th so there is baking powder. So we do have the baking powder. There's liquid in the cake. And so the, the baking powder was activated by the liquid. And then the cake went into the oven. And then the baking powder was activated again by the heat. So we got a little bit more of a lift. Um, but the taste of this was soggy, mushy, greasy and flat. And so <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Okay. And again, we'll pass out some of these. Then we tried no baking powder. I don't have one here, but um, no baking powder. So we had baking soda, and this actually ended up being a little bit better. The baking soda reacted with the buttermilk. We got a little bit of lift, and we made a pretty decent cake. Um, this cake was cakey, sandy, cottony. So it's not awful, but it wasn't, it wasn't great. <laughs> then we tried one with melted butter, which this was something that surprised all of us because we spend so much time at the bakery talking about how important it is to cream your butter and sugar for a really long time, make sure you create as many air pockets as you can. Um, and then I said to my pastry chef, I said, just make one with melted butter. Don't do any creaming, just melt the butter, add the sugar, and go. So we thought it was gonna be really dense, but there, it turns out there's enough, I guess, enough liquid in the melted butter, and there's enough um, liquid in the eggs, and then there's the baking soda and the baking powder, all of those things created what I found interesting was everybody liked this cake, and then when they tried it, um, a couple of people said it tastes like a cake box cake. And if you think about it, um, when you make a cake box cake, it's usually you add oil and eggs, and you're not doing any creaming, right? You're just mixing everything together. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The next thing we tried was adding half the amount of sugar, just to see, um, you know, would it not brown as much? Um, would it be drier? Uh, would it have a little bit less lift because we have, you know, fewer of those little garden hose creating all those air pockets? Um, and this one was eggy and dry in the throat, but this one was interesting. Everybody really liked this because it tasted like pancakes. And so <laughs> if you think about pancakes, and I think with, with that, um, what did you call that? The 
Paul something, whatever, that, <laughs> that, that chart, there was a thing for pancakes and it was down at the bottom. It was very low sugar. It was high proportionate flour but low of sugar. Um, and that's exactly what the cake recipe was. Once we looked at it, we're like, oh yeah, it's kind of like a buttermilk pancake recipe. So it was really, really good, but after, you know, it tasted a little bit dry. And then after, you know, the day, the, the leftovers were just really dry because they didn't have that, um, that, that thing that sugar does, which is draw in moisture. And then we wanted to try, I, I was just curious about this. So this was no leavening whatsoever, so no baking soda and no baking powder. But I wanted to try whipping the whites and whipping the yolks just to see if we could get something. And what this one ended up tasting a little bit like was like a pound cake, um, which is how people used to make, you know, back at 200 years before when they didn't have baking soda and baking powder, they would just make cakes with, um, just by beating up uh, eggs and sugar. Um, and this one tasted sour because, again, we have the buttermilk, but we didn't have the baking soda that reacted. Um, and it also tasted, and this might just be because in the bakery we're very conscious of this, it tasted very meringue -y. So when you make meringues, you just mix egg whites with sugar and you beat them. And we're often trying to combat the meringue effect that happens sometimes, which is like for the brownies, if you, if you whip the eggs too much and you bake brownies, at least a flour, um, what happens is the, the brownies rise and then they fall and you have like this crispy, crunchy top on top, which we don't like. Um, and so that's what happened here was it came out of the oven and we were like, wow, there's no baking soda or baking powder, but it still looks so great. And then it kind of fell, which I don't think you can really see in the picture, but w there was kind of that top that was felt a little bit like meringue. And then this was the regular birthday cake. Um, and this one, and honest, I did not, you know, tell people which one was which, but everyone was like, the first thing that everybody said, it's everything you want a cake to be. <laughs> Fluffy, light, tender, delicate, balanced. So we were very pleased with that. <laughs> and this is the cake recipe. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to make this cake and kind of talk. And as I'm making the cake, they're going to pass out the little portions of cake that, that I made for everybody. And then I'll cut up, um, oh, so sorry. So this was, the, this was the regular one that came out great. So you can see the visible difference. If this, is, if this is regular and this is without any baking soda, this is without any baking powder. OK, so the first thing we do in making this cake This butter is at room temperature. If the butter is too cold, your sugar isn't going to have enough strength to do its thing. I'm not making this cake by hand. <laughs> You want to see if it, if it just goes without? Oh, OK. Oh. <laughs> OK. OK, so we're going to, I'm going to talk you through this. <laughs> They like that. <laughs> so I just want, I thought it would be nice to kind of sum up the whole thing and make an actual cake, which you guys are tasting right now. So what you do is you cream the butter and the sugar. The paddle beats the, the butter with the sugar, and all of that garden hoe action happens. The butter turns from yellow yellow to pale white, um, and that's probably going to take like five minutes. Then we add the egg yolks, and I add them slowly one by one. And what I'm trying to do is create that emulsification 
because if I can get the eggs to emulsify into the butter and the sugar, then when I add the flour and I add the liquid, I'm gonna create all these opportunities for air. In this particular recipe, we also add additional egg yolks, and that's to create even more tenderness, even more opportunities for emulsification. And then this recipe has buttermilk and then cake flour with some baking soda and baking powder. And the way we add the liquid and the flour to the cakes, uh, to the batter at this point is what's called the three-two method. And you start off with a third of the dry and you put a third of the dry in and you're just gonna mix it just until it barely comes together. Then you're gonna add in half of the buttermilk, then you'll add the second third of the dry, then you'll add the rest of the buttermilk, and then the rest of the dry. And that way you're kind of gradually introducing both of these sets of ingredients which you want to be combined into your cake. And at that point, the cake goes into the cake pan and then into the oven, and that's when all the magic happens with the heat and all of those different options of how the heat can create air bubbles and steam and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm, I thought I would pass out some of these cakes. I don't know if anybody wants bad cake. Does anybody want bad cake? Um, so, so that is, that's all I prepared. So if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer questions. So there must be questions. We actually, we usually have a microphone that we can give you to ask the question with. No, no, but you you're being cake. The question. Um, Who wants bad cake? No, you can speak loudly. Speak loudly. Uh, this is no baking soda. It's really bad. In your book, you talk about the action of creaming. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, in your book, you talk about the action of, of, of creaming and why all the cake recipes start that way. And you also mentioned that we see a lot of chocolate chip cookie recipes start that way. And, and I can't throw. Why, why would you do that if you wanted a dense chocolate chip cookie? And I wonder, have you ever tried chocolate chip cookies using the melted butter method? And we have, yeah. How that compares with so, not, not creaming, but just incorporating it with room temperature butter. If you have... You mean melted butter versus room temperature, room temperature butter? So cookies. melted butter, um, it turns out, makes a little bit of a crispier cookie because you don't have all of those air pockets that you're creating. And so you're just melting butter. You've got melted butter, mixing it with sugar, and then... Do you want to pass out? Okay. Um, and so it just it, it creates a flatter, crispy cookie because you don't have all of that leavening from the air. So... Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, wait. Next question. So, next question. Yes, you. Here. There's a microphone. Here, the, I'm right there. Him. Okay. See, isn't this exciting? Nice. Um, I, I've had, um, or I've seen some recipes where almond flour is used in place of, um, regular flour, um, and it wasn't just sort of a gluten-free kind of a recipe, even though it turns out to be that way. Um, what properties of almond flour um, are there that make it so appealing to be used in cakes? Because this actually tastes a little bit like you use it. It's a good thing, so. Well, almond flour does not have any of the gluten that's in regular flour. So you don't, you don't get any of the stretch and the chew. Um, and it doesn't have any of the ability to capture air. Um, and so I don't usually view it as a substitute for regular flour. I mean, we definitely use almond flour in a lot of things. And especially because of the gluten-free craze that's going on now, everybody wants to know what you can substitute. Um, I don't think you can really substitute almond flour for flour. There's other flours that you can substitute for flour, but you can certainly incorporate almond flour into a gluten-free recipe, which is what we've done. Uh, but it has such different properties than regular flour that it's 
it's like you're not, you're not comparing apples to apples at that point. You know, you're, you're adding almond flour to something. It's sort of like the question about are you creating a new recipe. At that point, I think you are creating a new recipe. You're not saying, I'm going to take out some flour and add some almond flour. You're saying, I'm going to take out some flour and then new page. I'm going to add some almond flour, which is a different, it, it, you get a different thing. I have a question in the back. You, you, you. Sure. So, I mean, the thing, the question is, how do muffins differ from cakes? And I think in order to answer that question, everybody has to erase from their minds the Dunkin' Donuts muffin that you think of, because a Dunkin' Donuts muffin is a cake. It's just in muffin form. Um, does anybody else want baking soda cake? Okay, I'll just let you guys pass it around. Um, so that's no leavening. So the muffin, or what a muffin is supposed to be is not as, it's sort of like a pancake. It's supposed to be less sweet and not as cakey. Um, and a lot of, I don't know if, you know, if you read a lot of muffin recipes, they say um, don't over mix. And the reason is because there's not a lot of sugar and there's not a lot of fat. And so you don't want something that's really tough because when you have sugar and you have fat, it coats the flour particles and the sugar cuts through all the gluten and you create a tender product. But in a muffin, they're not supposed to be, be very sweet and they're not supposed to be very fatty. It's just supposed to be like a little small, I mean, cake is the closest word to it, but it's not really a cake. And so because you don't have the sugar and the, as much sugar and as much fat, that's why with both pancakes, you know, waffles and in muffins, they say, mix until barely combined. And it's because you're gonna be mixing dry ingredients with liquid ingredients. And as soon as liquid hits the, the dry, you're gonna start creating gluten. So you just wanna be really careful. You don't have that much fat or sugar to help. So you're gonna be very careful. Mix it just until it comes together and then bake it. So there's a question in the back. Yep, um, I tried uh, some sweet breads with very nice, uh, over here, sorry. I uh, tried some sweet breads with very nice uh, crust, um, like crispy, sweet, and, and uh, I was wondering if you could say a few words. Uh, I mean, I guess it's not, not for the cakes like this, but uh, what, what determines if you get a nice crust? I mean, is it ingredients, is it temperature, or anything? Well, I think that one of the main things is um, the sugar content will help because the sugar will caramelize in the oven and then you'll, you'll get a little bit of a crust. Um, I think the heat of the oven is something that a lot of people underestimate because a lot of home ovens aren't calibrated. And so when you put something into a 350 degree oven, it might only be 300 and you actually need that burst of heat to create the crust. Um, but I think the main thing that does the, the, the nice crust is the mixture of the, the fat and the sugar together and they kind of form like a crust on top. That's my guess. Hi. Oh, Hi. thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, a friend of mine who's a friend of mine who's a bread maker um, has a a jar has a jar um, that is a culture. And can you go over what that is, substituting in what you're what you've shown so far, the culture, and also is that only used in making breads, or do you use that also in in baked? Sweet goods. So the culture is what I was talking about briefly with sourdough. Um, what he has is what's called a sourdough starter. And he may have gotten it from somebody or he may have created it on his own. But you can create one by, I mean, one way is to take um, mashed up grapes and you should get organic grapes so that, you know, it has all that stuff on the outside. It has the yeast, the natural yeast. And mash up the grapes with some water and some flour and just let it sit, like cover it a little bit, like with a gauze or, or, or something. But don't, don't, put, um, don't put it in a sealed Tupperware or don't put saran wrap so that the air can't get into it, but cover it so that like bugs don't get into it. So take some a kitchen towel and, and leave it out for a week and then peek into it. And a week later, it's gonna be all bubbly and fermented, and that's because all of the yeasts have come through, and all the yeasts that are in the grapes have come out, and they've eaten all that flour, and then they've created all of that gas. And then what you do is you add a little bit more flour, I mean, you take out the grapes, and then you add a little bit more flour, a little bit more water, you stir it around 
cover it and you leave it for another day. And you're basically just feeding it. It's like you know feeding a plant or something. So you feed it, you feed it, you feed it, and then eventually what you have is a starter. And you can take that starter, so if you feed it and you have this big amount, you can take half of it and dump it into a bread dough, and then you don't need the packages of yeast. You can just use all of those active yeasts that are naturally occurring in the starter, and then you'll make a bread dough with just the starter and more flour and more you know, water and whatever else you want to add to your bread dough. And then all of the yeasts that are in that starter, they're going to be so happy because you just gave it all of this new food and it's going to eat it and eat it. And that's what makes your bread dough rise. And then you'll stick it into the oven and they get really happy because they like the heat until you kill them. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you make, and then it's a loaf of bread. Um, I forgot the second part. Oh, yes, can you use starters for other things besides bread? Yes, you can, um, you can make sourdough. Actually, a, there's a great recipe in Nancy Silverton's book, I think it's Desserts, where she makes a sourdough pancake. And she just uses, rather than baking powder which, or baking soda, which a lot of people use when you make um, pancakes, is she uses a starter. And so you mix starter with a little flour and a little bit of egg and a little sugar or whatever, and then you make these pancakes and they rise and they're beautiful. And you can make, you can make a chocolate cake out, you can make a cake out of it. Um, but the thing with yeast, like I was saying before, and the reason why people don't use yeast that much for cakes and why everybody loves baking soda and baking powder is that yeasts are very temperature dependent and they're very time dependent. So they, they don't like the cold and they don't like the heat. So if you make a cake with yeast, you have to watch the temperature. And then they're living things that need air and food. And so if you don't give it enough air or food, eventually it will die. So with baking soda, baking powder, you don't have to worry about it. But with yeast, you kind of have to watch it a lot. So you can make a cake with yeast, but most people don't have the patience. So let's take sort of on the order of two more questions. Joanne has a book signing outside afterwards, and I want to make sure we leave time for that. What about you, Red Shirt? You, yeah, you. Um, so I was wondering, a lot of most baking recipes call for the addition of a little bit of salt. And I know that's usually like in cooking to bring out the flavor. Exactly. Is there any science um, part of that as well? Like any reaction that that? To this my knowledge, in most of baking, no, it's just for flavor, except for when it comes to bread. And we were talking about the yeasts and how they're very picky. So yeasts, get, they love sugar, and they hate salt. So if you put too much salt in your bread dough, it'll just kill the yeast. Um, but besides that, from my understanding, you put salt in just for flavor. There's a lot of baking recipes that don't have salt in them. One of you, yeah, sure, you can. Maybe one more. So, so you talked about um, what the chemical reactions for eggs and butter. Um, one challenge I found with baking for my coworkers is that some of them are vegan. Can you talk about other options, vegan options, and how they, how they differ? How to bake vegan? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, without, I mean, that's a big challenge. It's definitely challenging. Um, I mean, you can cook with oil. Oil will work just like butter, except that oil doesn't have as much water. And so it's often a challenge trying to create you know, the, the lift that comes from butter, and it doesn't have the same taste. Um, because you don't have the emulsification of eggs, that's also very tricky. Um, we have a vegan chocolate cake at the bakery that, that actually it does have a really nice cakey texture. I'm not sure how it does that, because it doesn't have any eggs in it. Um, I don't know of substitutes, per se. I mean, we don't. We don't do substitutes. It's going back to the question of how do you create new recipes. I mean, we often look at recipes, and we will do the average of recipes. Um, and when it comes to vegan, we'll say, OK, well, let's just take this ingredient out and see what happens. But because the bakers know most of what we talked about today, they can say, oh, well, if we don't have you know, egg yolks, then what's something else that we can substitute? And they'll play around. Um, but I don't know of like a way to take a non-vegan recipe and just kind of, it's the same with gluten-free. I, I wish there were an easy way. There might be an easy way, and I'm just not aware of it, but you can just substitute and just say, oh, well, if you don't have, well, with, with butter and oil, that's a very easy substitution. We often do that at the bakery sometimes. We'll say, you know what, let's take out half the butter and just replace it with the oil, and that you can do. But for something like eggs, I think that's harder. And then for dairy, um, soy milk is often used instead of milk um, when, when making, when you use dairy in recipes. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's a person behind you. Hey, you. 
So you talked about how yeast, it's, you know, they're alive and you need to keep them alive and if they stick around too long and you don't take care of them, they'll die. Right. But I heard in baking biscuits, somebody said that in order to get them light and fluffy, you need to have fresh baking soda and fresh baking powder. Is, does the age of your baking soda and baking powder matter? It does. That's a, that's a great question. We don't face that at the bakery because we just go through it so fast. But um, they, I, know, I remember from before I became a professional baker, all the recipes that I, would set, that I would use would say, you know, make sure you test your baking soda and baking powder and take a little bit of your baking soda and put it in um, vinegar and make sure it fizzes up and, and the same with baking powder. I mean, it, it's not, I don't think it's because it's, al it's not alive, but I think it does have a shelf life. Um, but I, I'm not sure exactly why it, I mean, I think just everything ages, and after a while it just gets tired. <laughs> Exactly. The recipes um, in your cookbook call for, if you're making like cookies, they make really big cookies. If you want to make them smaller, how do you adjust the, t you know, like I assume the recipe's the same up till I put them in the oven. How do you adjust the time when you're making the cookies a quarter of the size that you make them? Well, we make the mini cookies all the time at the bakery, too. Um, and, you know, it's, it, that, was, that was one of the most challenging parts of the book, was trying to pick a time for anything. I mean, if you ask, I have two bakers here at Flour, and maybe there's more, but there's two here that I know of, and we don't time anything. It's like you put it in the oven, and then you take it out when it's done. And so um, <laughs> it was a challenge trying to put a number to, you know, because we're in and out of the oven so, t so much. So what I tried to do in the book and what I encourage everybody who likes to bake to do is to, to look more at the visual cues than the time because, you know, ovens are different, ingredients are different, everything is different. I mean, I think this is why people who cook are like, oh, I can't bake, that's such a, you know, that's so crazy. But it, I find it fascinating that, you know, you could take the cookie batter one day and it takes 10 minutes and another day it takes 12 minutes and it might just be the oven, it might be the batter's a little bit older. So, you know, I, I would start by reducing the time. I mean, if you have the big cookies and you want to make them half the size, I mean, reduce it by, I don't know, take 25% of the time and just check. I mean, it, did, it does mean you're glued to the oven a little bit more. Um, but I think as long as you just keep checking and keep checking. But you, you're right, you should definitely bake them for less. Okay, um, yes, you. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, I just had a quick question about the um, creaming of the butter with the sugar. Um, what often happens when one adds uh, the egg yolk or the eggs is that the, yeah, it kind of falls apart, and I was wondering if there's a way to avoid that. So if you're creaming butter and sugar, and if you're doing it the right way, then the butter's at room temp, right? And then often what people will do is they'll add a cold egg. And so if you add a cold egg, if you imagine butter in the fridge, it's hard, right? And so the chill of the egg will immediately go into the butter and it'll, it'll freeze up the butter. So you want your eggs to be at room temperature. And the other thing and I wish that I could have shown you is that you want to add it a little bit by a little bit because you are trying to create this emulsification. You don't want to overwhelm the butter and the sugar, you want to just introduce a little bit of egg so it gets used to it and kind of embraces it and then a little bit more and it gets used to it and embraces it. Um, and then if you add it little by little, it'll just slowly get nice and creamy and it'll be all. Now if you don't do that, then you could just um, keep the mixer on and if you have warm hands or a warm towel, you could put it on the surrounding bowl to try to warm up that butter because it's probably too cold. <laughs> Um, and if you just beat it for a long time, eventually the the egg will beat in. But that's a great question because if you take a cake after that point and you if it's looking curdled and you don't keep beating it, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but then if you imagine what happens when you add the flour is that you're going to have flour that's then going to mix with a little bit of the egg and a little bit of the butter, and that's not what you want. You want it to mix with the whole thing together. So definitely keep beating it until it all comes together and becomes smooth. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi. Um, could you address the uh, baking powder and baking soda ratio and why you use both of those in a recipe or not? And if you can actually um, ruin a recipe by adding too much, I don't know if it's uh, normally a one to two ratio or if in so baking or. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm worried I'm not gonna remember the exact proportions, but I think it's one, two teaspoons of baking powder per cup of flour. So this assumes that you're just baking with like milk or you know water or something or soy milk. Um, and then for baking soda, which is a lot more powerful than baking powder, it's either a quarter teaspoon per cup of acidic ingredient or half a teaspoon. And I don't know off the top of my head. I guess we could just look. It's half a teaspoon, half a teaspoon per cup. Why you use both is kind of the whole point of the lecture, which is you want as mu many opportunities as you can to create as much air as you can so that you can have a really nice, light and fluffy product. Um, I mean, the, the cake that didn't have the baking powder that, oh, I don't think I brought it, but I, I showed it on the, was actually a pretty good cake. It just wasn't as fluffy as we wanted it. Um, if you have too much baking soda, so if you add too much baking soda and there's not enough of an acidic in ingredient, then you just end up with this really soapy taste. Um, and so that happens to us a lot. I mean, they look exactly the same, right? And if we often take them and dump them into containers because um, we'll, we'll get like these big containers of them and we'll put them in containers that are manageable for us. And sometimes every now and then they get swapped and you can always tell because th if it's too much baking soda, it's really, really soapy. And if it's too much baking powder, it often tastes really metallic. Um, but that's a great question because I remember when I first started baking and I was like, oh, I want a really light, fluffy cake. And so I would take all of the leavening agents and I would say, I'll just add more. You know, I'll just keep adding. And, and, but you, that's, that's what differs, you know, between cooking and baking. Like in cooking, you can say, oh, I really like the flavor of this rosemary. I'm going to add more. And you can and nothing happens and you just have a beef stew that has a lot of rosemary in it. But if you make a cake and you're like, oh, I really want it really fluffy, so I'm going to add even more baking soda and then you end up with a mess. If you have too much, the other thing that happens when you have too much leavening is that it can go into the, when it goes into the oven and it reacts with the liquid or the heat and everything, it starts to bubble up too much and then it gets flat. And so if you have too much leavening, it's like the cake gets really excited, it's got all these bubbles, but then it's like too much and it overflows the pan and then just kind of flattens out. So I'm gonna recommend we do one last question and then we're all gonna clap. So in the back, you haven't been in the back. <laughs> No, you. The pink stuff. Thank you so much um, for the lecture and for the great cake. Um, I find a lot of times that bakeries uh, don't really do yellow or vanilla cake very well. It gets really dry. I don't, why is it that yellow cake is so challenging? And then which of the levers would you recommend pulling to keep the cake from drying out at home? Which of the Which what? of the levers would you add more fat? Would you add more sugar? Is it kind of just a art? I would probably add, mm, I would probably add more egg yolks. Usually that's the first thing we go to when something's a little bit dry. I, I don't like to add more sugar because I don't like things super sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tricky adding more fat. You would think that fat would make it more moist, but it often makes it greasy. Um, and why don't other bakeries make yellow cake that tastes good? I, Often, um, it's just dry everywhere. I think the challenge in baking in general is for any bakery, um, it's not, can I make a good cake? Like anybody who's going to open a bakery has probably made a good cake before. The challenge is figuring out how can I make a good cake every day for the hundreds of people who come in and do it in a way that is labor efficient and you know, and, and tastes good and all the things that you want. And so sometimes I think what people do is they will make a yellow cake and then they'll bake it and then maybe serve it for two or three days because you don't want to not bake enough cake because if you don't bake enough cake, then the customers come in and they say, I want yellow cake, and then you don't have yellow cake to give them. So you try to overestimate, but then the next day when you have leftover yellow cake, do you throw it away or do you serve it? A lot of people say, well, let's serve it, and then that might be why. I mean, I think it's always the business part of deciding all of these things is so challenging because it's not just making a cake at home for your family, you know, and if there's leftovers, everybody doles it out and goes home with cake. 
the business part of trying to figure out how much to order and how much to make every day and what can you sell the next day and what can you not um, is challenging. And you're, you know, the whole point of, of a business is to bring in more money than you, you, you put out. And so I think sometimes the decision of deciding, well, maybe I can get another dollar for this cake, you know, if I sell it for another day is maybe why some places have dry cake. I'm, I'm just guessing. Thank you. So I'd like to propose that we clap. So we didn't get to all of the questions, but we got to a lot of them. We have bad cake in the front. I think this is bad cake. This is bad and cake. And Joanne is going to sign books outside, I believe. Yes. Um, and that's it.